evening everybody uh, okay. i am very pleased to have all of you join us through various platforms of uh, youtube facebook instagram twitter of gujarat university jiu sec uh, etc today we have gathered here to remember and fondly remember our uh, former and beloved president uh, dr apj abdul kalam uh, on his fifth year of passing uh, today's kalam memorial lecture that has been organized by gujarat university startup and entrepreneurship council uh, with the support of of course uh, gujarat university and the various funding agencies of gujarat university uh, we have with us uh, the very prolific uh, dr sanjeev sanya who is the principal economic advisor to the government of india he is also uh, Uh, a very noted economist of course uh, a writer a historian and he will be speaking about the history of uh, indian risk taking in this memorial lecture today uh, before we begin i wanted to mention a little bit about gujarat university startup and entrepreneurship council that we call as gu sec uh, it is a startup support system that is promoted by gujarat university uh, supported by various funding agencies including the national science and technology entrepreneurship development board uh, government of gujarat student startup and innovation policy uh, atul innovation missions uh, atul incubation center is also a, a, a entity at gujarat university they are supported by meti startup hub uh, of government of india as well as the industries department of government of gujarat we have been supporting startups since 5 years and we are one of the leading startup support organizations in gujarat and western india with over 135 startups that we support and incubate currently uh, our role is not just to engage the students and young uh, aspiring entrepreneurs of this region but to also handhold startups and bring in a culture of innovation in entrepreneurship across uh, across the region of gujarat and beyond uh, before we get to the lecture of dr san sanjeev sanya may now request uh, our honorable vice chancellor uh, shri dr himanshu pandya to uh, speak a few words as the opening of this program sir over to you good evening thank you rahul it's been a pleasure to welcome dr sanjeev sanya he hardly used this title doctor but uh, this is his second digital visit uh, to gujarat university uh, thank you so much sir for being with us and uh, always there to mentor us to support us to guide us how to go further with the current development and how we can contribute to the nation's growth today we are here for kalam memorial lecture let me introduce few things what we have initiated at gujarat university campus we have dr apj abdul kalam center for extension research and innovation under that we have three incubation which are centrally funded we are lucky to have all these three incubators and under that we have more than 150 startups working in a one co-working space besides that this university is having research park we are coordinating this research park from this dr apj abdul kalam center for extension research and innovation where we have all major pharmaceutical companies defense systems government of india's establishments and international establishments working from the same premises the idea is very simple here we want to have a linkage and coordination between the international agencies those who are dealing with the research and extension activities in the field of sciences law humanities medical healthcare and technology under this particular program today we are going to talk about dr apj abdul kalam he was not only a scientist but a scientist with wisdom i tell you first time that indian scientists arena feel that we can we too can dream and deliver this is not a small thing you know to dream to the international standards and to cope up with that level of research you need lot of persistence and we know that we are nobody to evaluate and judge the contribution made by dr apj abdul kalam nevertheless being a university we want to have a facility in the name of dr apj abdul kalam and we are ready with more than 60 crore investment with particular research park 
and from that particular premises we are going to deal with all these international agencies uh, without taking any further time i would now request mr sanjeev sanyal to say a uh, few things on how this economy and the role of uh, this great great leader and the scientist who was down to earth ready to discuss and interact with the smallest query of students so let us get inspired and let us learn something from this marvelous person marvelous human being dr apj abdul kala thank you so much thank you very much uh, it's indeed a pleasure uh, to be able to uh, present uh, and speak today and deliver the uh, dr apj kalam uh, uh, abdul kalam memorial lecture um the topic that i was given of course was uh, the topic of a history of indian risk taking and i think it is a particularly uh, appropriate one given that it's this is being hosted by gujarat university specifically jusec which is of course all about um, risk taking uh, it is also pr uh, particularly appropriate given that uh, it, this memorial lecture is named after dr abdul kalam uh, who uh, epitomized uh, epitomized in many ways the two things that i will talk about in this context one is the importance of resilience in the face of uncertainty and adversity uh, something very important at this point in time for the world uh, and the second is of course the idea of risk taking uh, in the sense that this is about being open to new ideas not in silos but across silos um, and um, in a world where you're continuously dealing with it not just intellectually but in multiple different ways so let me describe uh, president kalam in in just a few minutes so you'll see what i mean uh, he was born um in a family that had once actually been quite prosperous uh, they had been um those of ferrying provisions and uh, pilgrims uh, from rameshwaram to dhanushkoti uh, and even further out to the northern tip of sri lanka unfortunately with the coming of new technologies bridges and so on uh, this family fell in very bad times and and so um, president kalam was born actually in a very a poor family uh, despite this uh, this past of having once been very prosperous um but he uh, overcame these this adversity and he went on to become uh, of course uh, one of the most celebrated uh, uh, scientists india has ever produced and uh, he was a rocket scientist uh, very often the term rocket science is used uh, loosely in converse in everyday conversation to signify something very complex and difficult well he was a man who was a real rocket scientist um and uh, despite that field where he was clearly very accomplished he also went on uh, to the world of public life and went on to hold the highest constitutional and political position in the country at that of the president of the republic um but of course he was also a very good administrator i mean um he was not just a scientist in terms of being proficient in the pure area of science he ran large organizations um and bringing together um you know large teams and ran them to to achieve uh, aims particularly setting up of course india's missile program um so uh, while he was able being a, a accomplished uh, administrator he was also by the way uh, as many of you know an accomplished veena player um he was a practicing muslim but he was at the same time very well versed in the bhagavad gita so here is clearly in a sense the epitome of an uh, intellectual uh, risk taking of administrative risk taking spiritual risk taking uh, that was um, uh, that i'm going to now talk about so really the first thing that i want to talk to say is risk taking is a mindset it is not a, it doesn't work in a silo and there is no example of a, a country civilization uh, or a society that has been risk taking in one particular area and uh, but not in another so whenever we talk about uh, this we must remember that a rebirth a renaissance is ultimately about the spirit and in, indeed there is a word called the renaissance man uh, which of course describes president uh, abdul kalam very very well 
Now, before I go on to explaining the history of Indian risk taking, let me say it's sometimes easier to understand a concept um, from a little bit of a distance. So I'm going to explain this idea of a renaissance of risk taking uh, by talking about uh, another culture so that you first understand that before I come to India itself. Now, the term renaissance is very often applied to the European uh, renaissance, specifically that of the 15th uh, and 16th century, uh, when you had this extraordinary explosion of different kinds of inquiry and risk taking. Uh, this was a culture where there was a huge amount of uh, artistic uh, uh, risk taking. You had you had Leonardo da Vinci, um, uh, Leonardo da Vinci, and Michelangelo uh, in northern Italy, where it all started. Um, but you also had a roughly at the same time Galileo, uh, a scientist. This was also uh, roughly the time when the European numbers exploring the seas. Um, and as this uh, sort of uh, spirit uh, of the Renaissance spread northward to Holland and then to England, you see the same thing happening there. So Elizabeth in England, for example, uh, was very often remembered for uh, Shakespeare. Uh, but remember, it was also the, the, the country that produced Francis Drake, who sailed around the world. It was also the country that defeated the greatest uh, um, military force put together at that, at that time, the Armada, and sank it. Uh, and you see that everywhere. So um, when we think of the Renaissance, very often people may associate it with the art in Florence or in Venice. But in fact, remember, Florence was uh, first and foremost a banking center, it was a financial center, center. The Medici's, famous for their patronage of arts, were bankers. Uh, Venice was a uh, hub of trade, um, uh, particularly with the East. And so you had a, a flourishing of activities happening all of a sudden in each place. There is no, as I said, an example of a flourishing happening in a silo. Um, it always happens because the culture of risk taking happens simultaneously in different fields. Also important to remember that this flourishing happens not usually in a time of stability. Uh, ironically, um, it usually happens at a time of turmoil. So the Italian Renaissance started just uh, at about the time when the Ottoman Turks had taken over uh, Constantinople and converted it to Istanbul. Uh, this was a time when there was genuine fear in Europe um, of a large-scale Turkic invasion and takeover. And similarly, Elizabethan Britain uh, wasn't a stable place. Uh, there was enormous amount of concerns. Um, Elizabeth um, uh, was a queen without an heir, and there was a lot of worry about what would happen when she died. Uh, there was conflict inside uh, uh, Britain at that time between the Catholics and the Protestants. There was continuous suspicion of uh, Spain and there was fear that they would be invaded. So even through this period of turmoil, there was a, the, the spirit uh, of risk taking meant that they, they, they were able to do so many different things and sort of this opening up ultimately meant that Europe will, would ultimately go on to dominate the world for the next five centuries. Now, let's come back to India. We are very proud about the achievements of ancient India, but what were these people really like? Um, in what sense were they risk takers? And so really, we need to go back to the really to the beginning to begin to think about who are these people, these ancient Indians that we are proud of? Who, what were they really like? What were their attitudes to the world? Now, most of you will have gone through your school education. You will remember that Indian history books very often start off uh, with the Harappans in the Bronze Age. And usually what you will be told about the Harappans in the Bronze Age is that they built these cities that they had very straight roads and they had some good plumbing. Um, you will not be given any sense of how, what these people were really doing in these cities. What were they really like? But the archaeological evidence, however, suggests something very interesting about who these people were. Well, it turns out that the really guiding principle 
or, or, or of this civilization were not just laying out straight roads at right angles in their cities. But the really interesting thing about these people was the enormous amount of commercial and intellectual. Um, these, these cities may have been along the Indus and Saraswati rivers in northwestern India, but they had outposts um, in Central Asia along the Afghan Tajik border. And there are outposts of the Harappans um, in Sukta Denjor, uh, which is on the what is now the Iran Pakistan border in Balochistan. Um, but they were sailing much, much further out. Since I'm giving a lecture to Gujarat University, it would be quite interesting for you to know uh, that many of the sites in Gujarat uh, relate to long distance international trade. So many of you will, of course, know about Lothal and the fact that it had dry dockyards. But um, in, in order to understand Lothal uh, or even the other even bigger site of Dhulavira, you have to understand that the landscape you were dealing with was quite different. Saurashtra, for example, was not joined to the main, mainland as a peninsula, but is in fact an island because the sea levels was much higher. The run of Kutch, which you now see as salt flats, uh, were not salt flats at all, but they were the estuary of two major rivers, the Indus and the Saraswati. And um, it was actually in, in water. And so the island on which um, uh, Dholavira is based today um, looks like it's marooned in a sea of salt. But in fact, it was marooned in an estuary and it was a port. So if you go to Dholavira and you stand on this hill and you see, see look around you, uh, you will then understand why it was built. Today, it makes no sense because it is built in, in a place which is not accessible to anything. But if you imagine this as a port surrounded by the sea, then you will suddenly understand its importance. And from here, Harappan merchants would sail out westward, um, uh, out past uh, Dwarka, out towards the Middle East. They would, they would, there are, uh, they were trading with the Omanis. Uh, and then further out uh, with the with Bahrain and Qatar, and even further out to Iraq and to the Sumerian cities that were then flourishing in Mesopotamia. Uh, and there are records of um, community uh, of merchants uh, coming from a land known as the Meluha. Uh, and they came with what is clearly Indian products. Uh, they brought with them beads, they brought with them ivory and peacocks. Uh, and they traded with the locals. They were, in fact, so many of them that many Sumerian cities actually had enclave of uh, Meluhan um, traders who lived uh, in and around these cities. So what you see today, the Indian communities in the Middle East, they have a very, very long history, uh, very much linked to uh, India more generally, but specifically to Gujarat. Now, this world that I just described around about 2000, uh, went through a cataclysmic end. Um, climate changed um, and the river Saraswati dried up and uh, the sea levels changed and you, these ports, for example, Dhola Vira suddenly found itself marooned. Um, and so there was a complete change in the dynamics. Many of these Harappan cities had to be abandoned. This was very, very difficult times. But the migrations triggered by these the, 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 the collapse of the civilization uh, led to large numbers of people moving out. Some of these people moved out, for example, from Gujarat, uh, uh, the cities around Gujarat and moved down uh, to the Narmada Valley and further on. Um, the cities in the north, some of those people moved further north to set its other settlements uh, nearer to the Himalayas. But some moved the civilizations already flourishing. And the mixture of all of this led to the creation of what we now know as Indian civilization. Now, centuries passed and a new, civil, a new uh, period of prosperity emerged. And new cities emerged, many of them along the Gangetic Plains. Uh, for, some of them have survived to this day, for example, Varanasi from this period. There were new technologies that emerged, like the iron technology. Um, and the Iron Age, many people don't realize, as, uh, was triggered in India because the first systematic use of iron uh, anywhere in the world happens around 4,000 years ago uh, in the Godavari Valley uh, in and around what is now Hyderabad. And 
<clears throat> this was also a time when many of the uh, things that we considered to be quintessentially Indian came to be uh, came together. For example, uh, the great epics, uh, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana. But this was also a time of exploration, and you see uh, voyages setting sail from ports uh, along the eastern seaboard, uh, from um, Bengal and Odisha, uh, sailing down along the coast and settling in uh, Sri Lanka. Um, the people who we now know as Sinhalese, were the majority population of Sri Lanka, uh, have their origins from uh, merchants and explorers who came there from Bengal and Odisha. Um, uh, in the 7th and 8th century BC. And just like they were exploring uh, uh, down the coast to, to, towards Sri Lanka, many of them, these merchants also sailed eastward. Um, uh, and from there, uh, they sailed through Southeast Asia all the way through to the Mekong Valley. And you then begin to see over time the flourishing of Indianized kingdoms in Southeast Asia. Over the next 1500 years, there were these uh, amazing kingdoms, uh, high, heavily influenced by India that would emerge in Southeast Asia. And the influence of that time uh, remains to, with us even to this day. Uh, so uh, you see, for example, uh, the largest Hindu temple in the world is not in India. It's in Cambodia, Angkor Wat. Uh, to this day, for example, the island of Bali has a Hindu majority. Uh, you see that in place names, uh, the name uh, Singapore is clearly derived from the Sanskrit name Singapura, um, Lion City. Um, you say similarly the, the country that calls itself Indonesia. It calls itself after it became independent in 1949 after India. Its uh, currency is the rupiah. Uh, its national symbol is Vishnu's Garuda. So the enormous influence of ancient India is spread all over um, Southeast Asia all through to today uh, in multiple ways. And then it goes even further east. Um, Korean history, for example, begins with the marriage of a local prince to a princess who came from Ayodhya. Um, you see, of course, the influence of Buddhism in China, um, but you also have the remains of ancient Pallava and Chola era temples all along the coast of China. In Japan, of course, uh, there, are, there is enormous Indian influence through Buddhism, but lesser known also of Hinduism. Um, you know, one of the dominant uh, religions of Japan is uh, Shinto. Uh, the word Shinto itself uh, is derived from Sindhu or what in West Asia was Hindu. Uh, it's not surprising, therefore, that if you go to a Shinto temple, you will find um, uh, idols being worshipped of uh, Saraswati and of Ganesha. Uh, to this very day. So there was an enormous amount of influence eastward that happened from this uh, second flourishing from the Iron Age onwards um, that uh, happened uh, uh, in India, but also westward. So you have with the understanding of the monsoonic winds, Indian merchants would sail from the west coast of India to the island of Sokotra, just off the coast of Yemen. The name Sokotra itself is derived from Sanskrit. It, it comes from Dwipa Sugudhara, which means island of bliss. And from there, Indian merchants would make their way either through to the um, uh, Persian Gulf, but more often than not, up the, co uh, up the coast uh, through the Red Sea. And then from uh, the, the Red Sea coast, they would cross the sands to the Nile and then sail up to uh, Alexandria. And from there, it is said, many merchants even made their way to Rome. Uh, so much so um, that uh, uh, there was an enormous flow, so much, so much flow of Indian goods to the Roman Empire that um, uh, you had uh, senators uh, complaining in the Roman Senate about the loss of uh, uh, gold and silver coins to India from, uh, from this trade. But it wasn't just merchants who were uh, traveling. Uh, there were also astrologers, for example. We know, for, for example, that it was uh, very fashionable in ancient Rome uh, for um, uh, high-born ladies to have an um, Indian astrologer in their coterie, so to speak. So there were many kinds of people traveling, uh, both eastward and westward, uh, influencing the world. So. Um, but it was not just in the area of art and culture, even in the sciences, Indians were making 
huge amounts of stripes. India is, um, of course, the home of surgery. The earliest known systematic uh, uh, codification of surgery was done by Shushrut um, in perhaps 6th, 7th uh, century BC. And then further uh, through, um, uh, for example, Ayurveda, um, there was Indian contributions to the world include um, large chunks of uh, mathematics, uh, including, of course, the use of um, the, 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 the digit of zero, which uh, makes possible a lot of modern mathematics. Uh, all of this you know, but the purpose of what I was trying to tell you is to understand that these ancients were contributing in multiple ways simultaneously from science to the arts, uh, from the arts to exploration, uh, just in the same way that you see in the European um, uh, Renaissance that happened in the uh, 14th and 15th century. It is an explosion of activities. It's a, and this ha didn't happen uh, necessarily uh, without difficulty. There were continuously difficult things happening. I talked about climate change and how it caused the Harappan civilization to collapse. But there were invasions by the Huns and by the Sakas and Parthians and Indo-Greeks and so on. And through it all, India swallowed it up and was resilient. So it's about resilience and openness and risk taking throughout all those centuries. All the way through to the 11th and 12th century, when you have the Cholas, for example, uh, who um, basically had, through their naval power, uh, had taken control of much of the Denotion. Um, but this was also of huge amount of trade from the Fatimids in the, in the West through to the Cholas in India, uh, and then on to the Song Empire in, the, in China. Uh, and that was the axis of global trade and the global economy. Um, in, in the 11th and 12th century. Now, what, were the, what was driving all of this? Again, it is quite interesting that this was not just about individual effort or sailing in different directions, far from it. This was large scale activities. Um, much of the merchant trade was carried out by uh, merchant guilds, which include, included hundreds of merchants would be a part of each of these guilds. So they were almost like multinational companies um, but they were also um, trading with artisan guilds, which would also have, you know, hundreds of peoples. And of course, all of this was financed by temple banks. Uh, we tend to think of uh, in, uh, the great temples of ancient India um, as being centers of religion. But in fact, they were also centers of arts, of music and dance, of sculpture. But interestingly, they were also centers of finance. Uh, one of the reasons that in ancient Indian uh, temples had so much gold in them, which of course uh, would, would be a problem later on, um, was that they, they made their money actually by financing uh, many of these uh, infrastructure building, but of course the great voyages of these uh, merchant guilds. So they were providing in a sense the risk capital that allowed Indian economic power to, 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 uh, to power ahead. Unfortunately, in the around about the 13th century, this world that I described again fell apart. Um, it happened due to waves of Central Asian uh, invaders uh, that invaded India, uh, but also uh, the Middle East and China. So in India, of course, you had waves of Turkic invasions that um, wrecked the cities, uh, carried out large scale genocide, but also, of course, uh, completely um, uh, destroyed our financial systems by destroying the temples, which were the, the hubs of uh, financing. So not only were, was this, uh, you know, uh, culturally and in terms of human um, uh, shock, uh, these Turkic invasions were, uh, were very, very costly. They were also very costly in terms of uh, damaging the economic system on which uh, Indian um, mercantile power was based. Um, this incidentally also happened at about the same time uh, in the Middle East as well, where the Mongols raided and smashed their way through Baghdad. And it happened in, in, in China as well, when, when the, the, the Mongols essentially invaded and destroyed uh, the Chinese uh, empires of that time. Uh, but here it is quite interesting what happens, um, both in China and in the Middle East, 
uh, after a period of uncertainty and turmoil, there was a great deal of resilience that they, these, these parts of the world, and you see Safavids in Iran rebuild and, uh, uh, the Iranian civilization and economy. You see the same thing happen with the rise of the Ming uh, in China. And of course, the Mings would then set, send these great voyages under Admiral Zheng He to the Indian Ocean. Uh, we see sparks of that in India. Um, the Vijayanagar Empire, for example, uh, would attempt to rebuild the sort of glory of ancient India, quite self-consciously, by the way. But at the same time, there seems to be in many parts of, of, of India, a enormous civilizational loss of confidence. Uh, we imposed on ourselves uh, sort of these caste rules about not crossing the seas. Um, I don't know why exactly this happened, but it is very, very uh, evident in the sort of change in attitude. All of a sudden, a, a culture that was so much about risk-taking, about exploring the world, suddenly imposes this on itself, this idea that crossing the seas was somehow uh, a bad thing. And it didn't help us. Uh, it didn't rescue us from the rest of the world. Um, far from it, aided by newer invaders and ultimately culminating, of course, by the Europeans and uh, first the Portuguese, um, then later on the French and then, of course, um, the British who would end up conquering all of India. Now, um, even in this period of uh, distress of foreign colonization, there were flashes of brilliance. Uh, I, of course, talked about sort of the flash of brilliance of the Vijayanagar Empire. There was, of course, the, the, the brief period under the Marathas. And then, of course, uh, in Bengal and the Bengal Renaissance, um, again, <clears throat> happening at a time that was very, very difficult in many ways. Bengal had was, of course, the first part of India that had been colonized by the British. Um, it, of course, consequently was um, uh, 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 the victim of uh, much of colonial exploitation and repeatedly saw uh, famines all the way uh, to as recently as 1943. But it was also, uh, despite or, uh, this, showed a great deal of resili uh, resilience in the uh, uh, second half uh, of the 19th century and into the first half of the 20th century uh, in producing uh, remarkable people. Uh, there were scientists like Acharya Jagadish Chandra or Acharya Prafulla Chandra. Uh, there were poets of the caliber of uh, Rabindranath Thakur. Uh, there were politicians of the caliber of uh, Netaji Subhash Bose or, um, uh, or religious leaders of the caliber of Vivekananda. In, indeed, modern India is very much a product of the ideas and ideals that came out of this period of turmoil in Bengal. Unfortunately, this period of Renaissance um, at independence uh, may have been a very happy period for much of India. It was not for Bengal uh, or for that matter for Punjab. Uh, these are two provinces that went through a very painful uh, partition uh, and then uh, shocks, uh, repeated shocks. Um, and of course, culminating in the great genocide of 3 million um, Bengalis in 1971 and waves of refugees coming into India. Um, but as I said, um, great periods uh, uh, of, of Renaissance very often happen during periods of turmoil. But unfortunately, post-independence, uh, uh, Bengal did not uh, quite take Took, uh, take the same attitude as their forebears. Um, and so instead of taking these shocks uh, in the way, um, say, the their 19th century forefathers had done, uh, India, went, uh, uh, India in general, but Bengal in particular, went into a shell. And it, um, it began to fear uh, commercial risk taking. Uh, I remember as a child, um, uh, there were continuous strikes uh, happening against everything from, um, you know, by labor unions to uh, strikes against uh, the United States and its policies uh, to strikes by teachers unions. Uh, it was a, 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 an attitude against all, uh, uh, pushing back against all change. 
because it was a fearful mindset and this fearful mindset did not lead uh, to a great uh, a sort of flourishing uh, of public sector uh, uh, prosperity far from it uh, as one by one left uh, kolkata and bengal uh, their public sector uh, colleagues also left uh, bengal uh, many of them uh, leaving and uh, ending up in um, the relative safe haven of mumbai um but as i as commercial vitality ebbed away so did cultural uh, vitality um, bengal and Kolka kolkata specifically has never again produced anybody of the caliber of tagore or vivekanand or satyajit ray so just like as i said a rebirth is is all about breaking out of silos the renaissance is uh, the renaissance is all about uh, taking risk uh, in multiple areas it's a mindset about taking risk in the same way when it ebbs it tends to break down in every facet of life so kolkata which was in the 1950s not only the cultural and intellectual capital of india it was also the industrial capital of india it was in fact the most industrialized place in asia outside of japan in 1950s today yeah, it would rank well behind uh, say maharashtra or gujarat or the the, the delhi ncr area or the uh, chennai bangalore hyderabad triangle in southern india and so on uh, why did it happen because at some point in time um, bengal uh, lost this uh, zest for risk taking and in fact in a lesser way that also happened to india um when we became independent in 1947 um we too uh, sort of feared the world maybe it was because of our past of having been colonized by a multinational company the east india company uh, we began to fear the world so what did we do we put walls all around ourselves and we created a system of um fearing the world um a system of import substitution of licensing and again again can notice a fear of risk taking um but it also meant interestingly that a country uh, that was able to create even under colonial rule a nobel laureates in the arts like tagore or in sciences like uh, raman has never again been able to generate a resident um a nobel laureate in any field of uh, human endeavor i'm not counting here the nobel prize prizes because those are not in uh, uh, that they do not represent a, a national uh, uh, success in the sense that clearly in in, in specific cases of uh, that the two nobel laureate uh, prizes that we did win while they are of course great contributions at individual level uh, sadly they they represent failures of our society um in in terms of our inability to remove poverty uh, and exploitation so in terms of uh, 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 our ability to uh, you know push ahead in areas of intellectual um uh, uh, risk taking we after independence have not been able to generate even a single resident nobel laureate um and the same thing happened to us even in sports um um we were the same we used to win uh, before independence a gold medal in hockey in the olympics the sole medal we used to win and even after nine uh, 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 we stopped winning even those medals uh, by the 80s so it's only in the last um, 50 that again india seems to be opening up so of course the opening up of the reforms of 1991 uh, was one part of the, of the, of of the triggering of this opening up a uh, return of a of a risk taking culture that has begun to come back to india and this is important because for after a long time uh, india's share in the world gdp is slowly beginning to rise you're beginning to see indian startups uh, going out there and doing completely new things uh, but it is also consequently a time Uh, when we are beginning to see for example indians succeed again in sports 
and uh, you know in different kinds of sports and not just cricket and badminton and wrestling and so on because it's a return of a certain mindset of risk taking um you are beginning to see that um <clears throat> even uh, in literature and um uh, in music and other areas where you know if you uh, if you look at the kinds of contributions we are now beginning to make in many different fields and hopefully also very shortly uh with efforts for example in gujarat university we will be hopefully educating as we speak um in, you know future nobel laureates in the sciences and in literature and so on so the point i want to make before i uh, end this is very simple one that every country every civilization ultimately is successful because of a, a culture of risk taking and this culture of risk taking doesn't happen in silos and it doesn't happen necessarily at a time which is one of um of stability so the world is currently going through a huge amount of churn uh, uh, it's gone through a huge shock as a result of this pandemic uh, it's not just a health crisis it's, a, it's also an economic crisis but it's also a period of geopolitical shifts of technological shifts um of these are moments when uh uh you know uh, the history pivots around and so this is consequently also a moment where we need to go out there as indians as a country to take risks this is not a moment to hide behind uh, and try to hunker down because it are difficult times difficult times are precisely the times when great risks are taken when new things are tried when a, a society shows its true resilience and what my purpose here was through this uh, dr kalam uh, memorial lecture was to present this to uh, this idea to all of you um because i think it's a very important idea that uh, dr kalam himself embodied thank you very much thank you so much uh, sandeep sir for that very enlightening perspective on the indian history uh, some broad alternative perspective that are not a lot, lot of us uh, have access to or uh, the understanding of and the, as you rightly concluded that this was something that dr kalam so uh, strongly emphasized that the importance of risk taking the importance of thinking different the importance of uh, uh breaking barriers and, and and creating new things we can uh and as you said we've been trying to take those inspirations and do a few things at gujarat university ourselves uh, we have with us dr rakesh travel uh, the director of geosec who i would now request to say a few concluding remarks to conclude this session namaskar namaskar on behalf of gujarat university and geosec i take this privilege and honor to uh, welcome you sir and uh, i'm very much thankful that you spared a valuable time with us so uh, we are friends i think this is uh, we are concluding this uh, today's uh, talk on dr abj abdul kalam lecture series and uh, i am very much thankful to sri sanjeev sanyal ji principal uh, economic advisor to government of india for delivering a uh, remarkable lecture i, I would say uh, we passed through a lucid journey uh, through the history of risk taking and uh, i am also very much thankful to our honorable vice chancellor sir professor dr himanshu pandya and our pro vice chancellor sir dr jagdish bhaushar rahul dheeraj and all office bearers of geosec and aic for being there and thank you all wish you all a safe journey ahead thank you thank you thank you sir uh, for joining this program again and uh, with this i think we can conclude uh, today's session thank you all for joining who joined us through various mediums Take care. Okay. Thank you. Namaskar.